everybody. Uh, thanks for coming out. So my first question for y'all is, uh, who's familiar with etcd um, and basic idea and how it works? OK. Um, that's, that's a little over half the room. I'm going to give an overview uh, for the other third of the room in raise their hands. Um, so uh, etcd is an uh, adorable mashup of slash etsy, which is a configuration directory on a single Unix host and distributed. So the idea is that we want to have configuration data that's distributed over lots of hosts. Um, and in general, FCD clusters look something like this. So you have uh, five to seven, seven members of an FCD cluster, um, one of which is automatically elected as a leader, and then you have a number of followers. So in this case of a, a five-member cluster, there's uh, four followers and one leader. Um, and there's been a generic misconception that etcd can only run on five machines and then like you can never run any more etcd. Um, but how people use these sorts of systems in practice and, and how uh, etcd works is that you have, this, um, you have this cluster of machines that are actually responsible for creating the redundancy within the system. And then you have a number of proxies or standbys that actually run on, on each host. And, um, ensure that your clients, your applications that are using etcd can talk to a single port on the host, local host, some port, um, and then it gets redirected uh, to the actual quorum. And the reason that it's convenient to have this proxy is because this, um, this set of hosts here might change at runtime because individual hosts fail, um, etc. Makes sense, everyone on board? How, how do you guys like my very circular graphic? I worked really hard on that. Um, control yeah, V. Yeah. 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 The spacing on the boxes <laughs> is a little bit bad. Okay, okay, I'll correct that next time. You're getting around it pretty well. Okay, good. Um, so the entire idea and concept with etcd is that you want to design a system that is um, tolerant of individual host failures. So. Uh, this whole thing would be kind of useless if we had these five machines um, and the system had to uh, keep all those five machines running in, in order to continue operating, in order to continue accepting reads and writes. Um, so uh, etcd is a key value store and the entire idea is that in, in the case of an individual host failing, you're able to continue to read and write from that key value store. So um, in this cluster, our ideal cluster of five machines, um, one of those uh, follower nodes fails and etcd is fine. It's available, meaning that reads and writes still succeed. Um, if a second machine fails, uh, it continues to be available. Again, um, the cluster is operating fine. Read and writes work fine. And the idea and why um, similar systems like Google Chubby recommend a five-member cluster is because you'll generally have uh, one expected outage. So you're upgrading a machine or the machine uh, had hardware failure and so you need to pull it out and replace the CPUs. And then you can design for one expected failure. So somebody trips over a uh, power plug or you let the intern SSH into the host, something like that. Um, some practical uh, unexpected failure. Um, and then once a majority of those members are uh, uh, no longer operational, the cluster becomes unavailable. And the reason it's a simple majority, so in this case um, uh, two, two failures is okay but a third is not, is because this protects against split brains. So you always need at least a 51% vote um, in layman's terms in order for etcd to continue operating correctly. All right. Um, and etcd is also resilient in case of the leader failure. So if that little blue node in the bottom failed, uh, etcd does an automatic leader election, um, and that doesn't require any, uh, any system administrator to come in and involve themselves in choosing who the new leader will be. That's part of the consensus protocol is actually doing that leader election on behalf of the user. So it doesn't matter which of these uh, members actually fails. It continues to operate um, as expected. All right, so some of the applications for etcd. Um, there's uh, the first thing we built etcd for was this idea of locksmith, which is CoreOS does this AB partition updating scheme. And so um, it'll update one partition, reboot a uh, host, and then you'll be on the new partition. Obviously, this would not be great if uh, we had 100 members of an etcd or a CoreOS cluster and we rebooted them all at the same time. So you need to do some sort of coordination. And that's what etcd is designed to do is coordinate these sorts of things. So locksmith lets the system administrator say, I only want one machine or two machines rebooting at a time, and it sort of gives a ticket out to those machines that are rebooting. They return the ticket um, when they successfully come back from reboot, and the, the progress uh, of rolling out that update continues. 
Um, so essentially, the idea of a cluster-wide reboot lock is a, a use case for etcd. It's an application we built on top of etcd. Um, another use case is the idea of a scheduler. Um, and schedulers are uh, systems. Who's worked at Google or, or a system based on schedulers? Who's familiar with the idea of a scheduler? OK, so a little less than half the audience. So um, schedulers uh, are designed to make uh, our lives as engineers easier. So it, it starts with the center of the universe, yourself. Um, you, as the user, have some sort of payload, uh, some sort of thing that you want running in a cluster. So you say, I want 100 copies of my container running in this <coughs> environment. Um, I don't care where they're running. I don't want you to um, make, I want the computer to make the decision of it's running on node 1 or 5 or 5,000. Um, but all I know is that I want 100 of these containers running in the environment. So you describe this to the scheduler API. Um, the scheduler is a little piece of code that sits there and takes that request from the user via the API and shoots it off to the host. And the hosts actually are running that work, running those containers, running those applications on your behalf. Um, and they, uh, they, the scheduler is the active process of getting that stuff down to the machine. And so we've seen um, etcd being used by uh, a lot of, <clears throat> well, that's the basic algorithm, but it's not super interesting. Um, it's what I described. But we've seen um, etcd being adopted by a number of schedulers. Uh, so um, we've seen schedulers like CoreOS's fleet, which was the first sort of scheduler built on top of etcd. And then um, Google's Kubernetes uh, was built on top of um, etcd. Uh, and then um, Mesos is another one that uses etcd, and um, uh, Mesosphere also uh, uh, using etcd as, as this place of storing this configuration data and doing these sorts of master elections. Uh, the other use case for etcd, um, so uh, Mailgun, Mailgun in the house, yeah. Uh, Mailgun wrote a, uh, an HTTP load balancer um, called Vulkan, and Vulkan stores all of the information of what should be load balance and the configuration of that load balancer in etcd. Um, and so it, it's a load balancer that has an API and is resilient to uh, single host failures. Um, there's a project that Kelsey, our MC, uh, <laughs> wrote called ConfD, um, which takes information etcd and flattens it to configuration files. So for applications that um, don't natively talk to etcd and expect a configuration file, you can do that. Um, there's been DNS servers written against etcd. Uh, our speaker, um, our last speaker, Yodler, uses etcd internally for some of their systems. Um, and there's this really interesting prototype of doing distributed Git with etcd. Um, so etcd at its, at its core um, is this piece that helps you design against single host failures and um, is resilient to those sorts of leader failures. Um, but then there's applications that are built on top. All right, so uh, in December, December 18th, so a little over a month ago, we released etcd 2.0 RC1. Um, the first thing I'd like to note is uh, deciding on version numbers is hard. Um, so up until now, we've been running on zero dot something of etcd, um, and we wanted to make a big release. And obviously, you go to 1.0, right? Uh, we decided to skip it. Um, and the reason we decided to skip it is, uh, confusingly, our internal API, the API that clients talk to, is called the V2 API, because we designed an API initially and threw it out. And so we didn't want to release etcd version 1.0. Please use the V2 API. Just ugh, couldn't get over it. So um, we've decided to take etcd 2.0 RC1. Um, and some of the big changes that have happened since RC1 a month ago, uh, most importantly, we got a cute logo. Um, this, is, uh, this is Etsy, um, and uh, that, the logo um, of the project, and you can now find that those logos, SVGs and PNGs in the Git repo um, that were checked in after the RC1. Uh, we've made some changes to how bootstrapping works um, inside of etcd. You can now use DNS, which was a feature that landed since RC1, and then obviously the usual slew of bug fixes and documentation fixes, et cetera. Um, have happened since that release on December 18th. So um, <clears throat> since all of you have been uh, imported into my GPG trusted keychain, and I know you all personally, and I can trust each and every one of you, I need you to keep a secret. No tweeting. Uh, tomorrow at 10 AM, we're releasing etcd 2.0. <laughs> OK? <laughs> Thanks. So shh, 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 shh. 
Um, I'll know who to unfriend if I see a tweet about this. <laughs> uh, so etcd has uh, had a really good uh, almost two years since we started the project. Uh, about 500 plus projects on GitHub are using etcd. We've had um, about a over 150 contributors um, to the project. I know contributing to a data store is uh, not everyone's cup of tea, um, but we've gotten a ton of really useful feedback from the community and some really impressive uh, uh, pull requests and bug fixes um, from a lot of people, even down to the core raft implementation, um, which, is, uh, which has been really helpful. So, um, and we obviously have all those cool applications like the mazes, the Kubernetes, the, the Yodlers, the mail guns using, um, using etcd2. All right, so what are some of the things that have changed since our 04 branch of etcd? Um, the, I'll be giving a, a demo of this after, but I want to kind of prep everything. Um, we have a, a nice backup restore system now. So etcd ctl has a backup uh, command. So you can, um, at runtime, while the cluster is running, um, back up the wall file and the snapshots and dump that into a new directory and um, safely do that uh, while the cluster is running. Um, <clears throat> so that's, that's a big improvement. Um, and it, it's a nice safety mechanism, too, in case you, you know, all of a sudden lose everything and all you have a, is an EBS snapshot or something of your etcd um, on disk information. Um, we have DNS cluster bring up. So you can set up a serve record um, for your DNS cluster and bootstrap off of that which is really nice if you have uh, control over your DNS um, and is, uh, is another way of bootstrapping the cluster over our existing discovery process or discovery.etcd.io or uh, manual configuration where you provide all the IPs and ports uh, on the command line or in configuration for etcd. Um, we've added a number of uh, cluster configuration uh, tooling so you can add, remove, and list members from etcd CTL now. Uh, this had been exposed via an API before um, but we, we built a bunch of tools to make this a lot easier and way more explicit and safer, which um, we'll get into another feature and some of our lessons learned while building at CD 2.0. Um, we've introduced an explicit proxy mode. This is replacing the standby mode. So you can explicitly say this machine is a proxy and, uh, versus uh, being a full member of the, of the consensus. So all those little yellow dots that we remember versus the blue and red dots. Um, and so this is an explicit mode that you can set. So you can um, set up, bring up a machine, say, my cluster's over here. This proxy will just actively make sure it's keeping track of the configuration of that cluster every few seconds, checking in and saying, how is it configured now? Who's the current leader? And, and storing it, that information so your application doesn't need to. Uh, and then we improve documentation, <laughs> um, which uh, there's always that, that uh, that's, that's a major feature because it reduces the strain on people um, asking questions in IRC, uh, reduces our load on Rob, who's our uh, IRC fairy, I think is what he's been called most recently, um, and, uh, and making it better for people to figure out the system without, without asking people um, directly. Uh, and the other thing is we learned a lot of lessons. So over um, adding all these new users and applications on top of etcd and lots of people using etcd in their environment, um, we've also uh, corrected some mistakes we made. Um, no software is perfect. And, uh, and so we've learned a few things that I want to share with you. Um, first is that uh, log files are hard. So uh, etcd04 uh, was using a log file that did a few things a little strangely. Um, a lot of databases, what they do is they every time they get a transaction, they just uh, append, append, append those transactions to the end of the log. Um, before we were kind of rewinding the log, depending on the use or depending on what was happening, and so uh, this rewinding action meant that you couldn't necessarily safely back up the the log at any time while the etcd was running. So uh, etcd's new log is now completely um, uh, append only, and um, we've also added checksumming because we found that one user actually had a corrupted log. So the protobufs that are stored on disk got corrupted, which confused etcd to no end. Um, you know, a single bit flip on an integer that's packed into a protobuf uh, can uh, be pretty important. It's the difference between uh, one and a million, right? So, and then uh, we also started throwing out and erring on broken log files that don't pass uh, the CRC checksums. Um, so this is a pretty important uh, feature to fix um, in this release. And it's, it's one of the major things that we did in uh, the 2.0 release. Um, the other thing is that we, 
found that misconfiguring etcd was really easy. Um, so uh, it turns out that you shouldn't always trust user input. <laughs> um, and so a lot of times users would uh, accidentally um, uh, configure one cluster to talk to another cluster, which leads to confusion. Um, they would uh, remove machines and then re-add them with old data, leads to confusion. And so um, all these things are now protected against. We've added essentially UUIDs throughout the internal protocol. So each machine gets a UUID that's permanently removed and appended to the end of the log that this UUID can never be um, talked to again once it's been removed from the cluster. We've added a UUID that identifies a cluster uniquely and all these things. Um, uh, and so we, we learned a lot. Oh, the other thing that always happened quite a bit was people would do a clone of a virtual machine on their cloud environment. And so you'd bring up another etcd that was named identically, that would have the same, uh, all the same information, and that would also confuse the cluster uh, because we weren't rejecting messages from members that were already talking to us. Um, so these were all major lessons learned is don't, don't trust user input all the time and make sure you check some all the things. Uh, don't trust disks. <coughs> All right, so let's do some live demos of some of these things. Um, so what, what I have here is um, I have a few different terminals. The first is I have uh, this terminal down in the, uh, right here uh, that is going to be doing a while loop and just writing the current date into etcd. And then I have another window over here that is going to be watching changes on that. And every time the change happens, it'll print out the change that's gone into etcd. Um, and so this is just showing off two features of setting and getting keys and waiting on keys to change within the etcd cluster. I also see my first typo. So if anybody uh, sees typos when I'm you going on. <coughs> Sorry? Oh, the other, the other yeah. Too. I don't know what happened there. I think it's actually just a, yeah, it's a mistake in Tmux. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. Um, all right. So. Uh, right now, there's no cluster running, so it's saying, hey, I can't talk to anybody. So the first thing that we need to do is we'll bring up a cluster. This is a fresh checkout of um, etcd um, from master. Uh, and uh, we have a, a, a build script. So essentially, if you have a Go environment, you can type build, and then we have a proc file. Who's familiar with proc files? OK, proc files um, are like uh, a div they're used internally at Heroku, but they're also a very convenient way of running things um, on your laptop, uh, sort of like an init system. So I, we've defined a number, of, um, a number of copies of etcd here. And so there's etcd1, 2, and 3, and, um, and then all the command line parameters to statically bootstrap a cluster. And so there's a, a Go implementation of a proc file runner called uh, Go Remin, because the original one was called Foreman, so you just place that thing, make a Go somewhere in the middle, and now you got a name for a Go project. Um, and so uh, uh, Go Remin will launch this etcd cluster. And you'll notice a few interesting things. Um, first is that uh, there's an there's actual unique cluster identifier here. So um, the cluster has uh, this UUID, essentially, this, this completely um, unique name that belongs just to this cluster. And then each of the nodes have uh, unique identifiers, too, that are kind of randomly generated um, at, at initial bootstrap time. And this is part of the, the protections that we've added internally to, to etcd. Um, so now that I have a cluster running, um, my writes are succeeding uh, into the cluster. And then I'll also uh, start up um, this watcher. So you'll see after the, um, uh, after the writes succeed, then the, the watcher triggers. And then um, what, what I'll do here is just go through some of the new operational things in etcd. So uh, one of the things that people get um, a little confused about is whether etcd can survive a full down and up. So I have this five member cluster. Can it survive if all five members crash and then are brought up? Say I lose out, uh, power into the entire AWS region that uh, etcd is running in. And that, that's perfectly fine. So you'll notice your clients obviously time out because the etcd cluster is no longer running. So if I, um, this is going to, yeah, so there's no etcd processes running. And then if I restart, uh, you'll notice that it, it's restarted. <coughs> um, the clients are able to reconnect and make reads and writes. And then all the data, so you'll notice that etcd index is, is sequentially increasing. Um, so all the data that was stored in etcd is still stored in etcd. The, the log file and everything hasn't been lost. Yeah? It looks 
like the things it's reading, the RAP index and XCD index are like a little bit behind? Yeah, because it's, um, it's because Tmux is like sort of off a little bit. Um, and I can't fix the buffer for some reason. So, oh, okay. yeah, I don't know. It's because of the resizing. Anyways, it, it's after that write succeeds, it's triggering an immediate read on the other side. Um, and then, uh, so, so etcd can survive that sort of full down, full up. And that's because it's serializing all the writes to disk into this log file. Um, and then the other thing that we've done uh, in this release is those, um, those member subcommands, so adding and removing machines from the cluster. So uh, what I'll do here is I'll add another member to this three-member uh, three cluster. We'll call it infra4, um, since they're named infra1, 2, and 3 already. And so the information that I have to give it is um, the, name of the, the name of the new member in the cluster, and then also the, the IP import that it can be contacted on. And this IP import can be, a, um, can be a list. So you can have multiple addressable IPs and ports. Um, so um, what I'll do here is I will go into, I forget what I name this thing. Hmm, hmm. What directory is it in? Um, oops. Well, and I named all my commits work in progress. <laughs> <laughs> Womp, womp. Oh, there we go. Okay. The directory is called new member. <laughs> uh, so this new member um, thing is just another proc file that brings up this, this etcd process called infra4. So if I run um, go ream and start on this one, it should bring up a, a single etcd uh, member. And then we'll see that um, it was assigned its own unique address. And if we go over here, um, we'll see that the, the other the other cluster members that were already running etcd1, 2, and 3 um, saw that this new member was added and it started to write um, to it. OK, great. And then um, what we can do here is we can do etcd CTL uh, member list. And we'll see that there's all four members in there. Um, and then we can do etcd uh, CTL uh, member remove. And then that, that name that we gave it, infra4. Oh no, what did I do wrong? <clears throat> Is there a typo? Oh, right, the ID. So uh, they're actually uniquely identified by the ID, not the name, which Walden just helpfully reminded me of. So the ID of infra4 is uh, FAF something, something, something. So um, that, that removed the member from the cluster. And then um, what, what you'll see here is that the, the member, um, before it was removed, tried to send a few messages. And those messages got rejected. Um, so the cluster said, that UUID is not recognized anymore. It's in our permanent removal list. So um, please, please don't accept any rights from that. And the, the infra4, noticing that it's getting rejected from the cluster, actually shut down and told the user, this member has been permanently re removed from the cluster. If you want to re-add this member, you need to remove the data directory and, and re-add it um, from scratch with a new unique ID. And this is to help protect against misconfigurations and split brains. Um, so we, we kind of have that, that dynamic runtime uh, configuration stuff that's been added recently. Um, the other thing that we ha can do is uh, we can reject mis misconfigured members. So some, uh, we'll, we'll blame the intern again. So if the intern uh, knows the IP imports of our cluster, he's testing stuff on his laptop, and he's able to connect to those, he may be able to just you know, start pushing messages to that cluster. Um, so if we have a misconfigured uh, peer, so this peer is trying to identify itself as, um, as infra7. It knows the IP imports, um, so it's trying to connect with the rest of the cluster on ports 7001, 7002, 7000, et cetera. And if, if this guy gets started, um, similarly, he'll try to join the cluster. And it'll say, sorry, you have a conflicting ID. This, this member was never properly joined to the cluster. So we're going to reject any requests from you. Um, please come back with the correct ID of, and be correctly added to this cluster instead of just trying to jump in and join um, the cluster without being known. And then the final thing that we added was the, uh, the ability to do um, backup and restore. Uh, really easily and consistently from the command line. Uh, so 
we have this cluster here. We'll pretend like there's a full outage, something terrible happened um, to the cluster. And, but we do have a copy of one of the etcd directories. So we'll take a backup of the etcd directory um, from infra1, and we'll put it into a restore directory. So uh, what that did was it scanned through the wall file of that cluster and then wrote out a new copy into the recovery.etcd directory. Um, and so in this, uh, in this example, we have a proc file that brings up etcd. It only has a single member in the cluster, and we'll call the name of that recovery, for lack of a better name. And then we have a flag essentially telling the cluster, hey, you're going to start as a new cluster, generate yourself a new UUID base, and force that into the, into the wall, into this backup, and then start yourself anew as a single member cluster. So this is a way of recovering your cluster from scratch. So you had this five member cluster, something terrible happened, all you have is the backup. I still want that data. I still want all the, all the versions of that data being in the same order as they were before, but I want to recover. So uh, I am able to run go remin um, start on this. And it'll say, great, I started the cluster. I started myself as the only member of that cluster. And our writes picked up um, from the indexes where they were before, so in, in the high 300s. Uh, so apparently, I've been talking for around 300 seconds. Um, and so the cluster was able to be uh, restored and um, restored from backup and started as a single um, as a single member cluster. So if we do a member list here, we'll see that there's a single member now in this cluster, um, just that one recovery node. And so uh, in this disaster recovery, you can then start adding nodes again and get your cluster back up and running from scratch. All right. So uh, those are some of the features that we've added into etcd um, 2.0 over the 04 branch. Um, a lot of uh, protections against misconfiguration and backups and that sort of thing. Um, so I want to thank you all for uh, listening to the presentation. And I also want to remind you that um, uh, we like pull requests. So we have a repo on GitHub, and it's Apache license. Um, so there's also a bunch of bugs that have been labeled as um, things we need help with. And we're looking at adding um, a lot of new features after this 2.0 release. So we'd like, we've started designing a, a version 3 API. Um, we're looking at how to make our internal store a lot more efficient, um, how to improve memory consumption, you know, all the usual things in software, faster, less memory, um, more efficient. And so um, 2.0 is really just the start of a lot of new stuff that we'd like to add um, in order to better support all the applications that have been built on etcd. So uh, at this point, I'm going to hand it over to Kelsey, but thank you for your attention.